Uh, the first talk is going to be about uh, some MR physics, and we're going to talk specifically about diffusion imaging, because this is uh, probably of greatest interest in the world of stroke imaging. So with that, we'll get started. Let me just change this up a little bit. So uh, what I want to review here is the uh, where the contrast arises in diffusion weighted imaging. And I want you to recognize that there are multiple diseases that can uh, show high signal on diffusion weighted imaging as well as restricted diffusion. So in contrasting uh, um, CT imaging with MR imaging, when you look at a CT scan, you're really looking only at one source of contrast, and that is X-ray attenuation. So obviously areas with high X-ray attenuation, such as the skull, look different than areas of low X-ray attenuation, such as fat and the fluid in the ventricles. So it's a linear uh, source of contrast. While MR imaging has at least six sources of contrast, and these are T1 weight, you know, the T1 contrast between tissues. So for example, fat has a short T1 relaxation time, fluid has a long, I'm sorry, has a long T1 relaxation time, T2 uh, uh, tissue contrast, proton density, meaning where there's very little water, like in the paranasal sinuses, we get low signal, uh, and the brain, which has, of course, more uh, water and uh, has a higher proton density. Then flow, we use flow, uh, and that's where the contrast arises uh, when we do MRA, both 2D time of flight and 3D time of flight. Susceptibility, which is the property of the distortion of the magnetic field that we take advantage on susceptibility weighted imaging. And finally, tissue diffusion, which is what we'll talk about today. To go through all of these really is a separate course on uh, MR physics. So the contrast on diffusion weighted imaging uh, arises from the differences in the movement of hydrogen nuclei. And this movement of water is extremely small uh, and, and so small that the movement of the brain uh, and the individual is enough that it would overwhelm this small degree of movement. And that's what requires uh, using very fast imaging. So usually uh, we use echoplanar imaging, which is uh, probably the fastest technique available. And in order to minimize the confounding effects of patient uh, and brain movement. So within acute infarcts, uh, the protons move less freely and thus we refer to this as restricted diffusion. So there's less movement in the acute infarct. And the, there's a theory, I don't know if this is, I think it's hard to prove, but uh, this is due to the influx of extracellular water through the injured cell membrane uh, into the uh, infarct itself. So the basis of diffusion weighted imaging comes from a Brownian motion, which was named by, for a botanist in 1827, who noticed that pollen in liquid, even though uh, he minimized any uh, movement of the liquid itself, he noticed that the pollen continued to move around inside the liquid. So it was sometime uh, nearly 100 years before this was explained by uh, Albert Einstein and another Polish researcher, Smolichowski, in 1905. And this was one of the foundations of the, of the theory of relativity, this idea that what Brownian motion was uh, attributed to was the molecular movement uh, from thermal energy. So this is just an image of sort of showing you what uh, Brownian mov movement like, might look like with these, in, in this case, moving uh, pollen particles within a liquid. So this, this is, in a sense, what we look at when we think about diffusion of water uh, in the brain. The way that the imaging is performed is a matched pair of uh, gradients is used. And so areas of the brain that move less will provide more signal in between these two gradients. So again, if there's more movement, we, we, the diffusion is greater. Where there's less movement, uh, as they say, where you have free extracellular water constrained by a cell, a damaged cell, 
that gives you uh, restricted diffusion. And one technical point you should be aware of is that uh, diffusion weighted imaging is always performed with chemical fat suppression. So if you're looking at an MR scan and you don't have a fat suppressed image, you can use the um, diffusion scan as a way of assessing whether you're looking at fat or something else with a short T1 relaxation time like blood. Now, I'm gonna introduce this concept of diffusion tensors. The movement of the protons may not be the same in all directions. And so the magnitude of motion in different directions can be measured. Uh, routine diffusion weighted imaging is performed in at least three different planes, but multiple planes can be used. And so the only limitation is really the amount of time uh, that is devoted to the acquisition of the data, but 20 uh, directions of motion or more uh, is certainly a possibility. And so uh, the, the terminology that's used is in the example on your left is this is called isotropic diffusion. And this is what we attribute to say the water in the ventricles, that this is free motion. It moves sort of equally in all directions and it has no one direction uh, of, of preferred movement. If you contrast that with the, here, I think representing these are uh, uh, axons that you might see within say the corpus callosum that the direction of motion is limited in this axis, but is freer in this axis. So this is called anisotropic diffusion. And so the diffusion tensor would be in this long axis. Now, what this uh, possibility with diffusion imaging is to make these tractography uh, images, which you've probably seen in the literature. And so this is, these images are created using uh, computer assistance by linking together the, the uh, tensors that seem to match best. So there's a little bit of subjectivity, I think, in the creation of these models, but they are uh, certainly visually very appealing and, and I think do teach us something about the structure of uh, tissues in the brain. So again, this prediction of the path of white matter tracks I think of like the breadcrumbs in the story of Hansel and Gretel, that you basically just go from one tensor to the next tensor in order to create these uh, models of how the, uh, the tracks are aligned. Some of the terminology we use in diffusion weight imaging, the one that usually people call the DWI image is, is, is strictly speaking is called the trace image. This image has both diffusion weighted information or contrast and T2 sources of contrast. So it's kind of a mixed image. And so you're looking at a composite of the diffusion properties of tissue and its T2 relaxation. If you wanna see a pure map of diffusion properties, you wanna look at what's called the apparent diffusion coefficient or ADC image. And so uh, uh, when you look at MR scans, you almost always get the diffusion scan or the trace image along with the um, ADC uh, map. And I would recommend you look at these both routinely. I know some individuals sort of skip over the ADC map, uh, maybe in the interest of time, but you'll learn a lot about the uh, uh, nature of diffusion uh, properties. And I think it'll be very helpful in dating the timing of the infarct if you appreciate how the infarct changes over time on the ADC map. And I'll try to show that to you. So Take this example, this is a 45 year old had new left-sided weakness. If we look at this flare scan, uh, I suppose one could argue that there's a little more signal on the right side than the left side and maybe a little blurring of some of the uh, cortical uh, sulci and sylvian fissure. But again, I think that's, uh, that's a, a tough call. Now, if you look at the same uh, uh, patient at the same time on the diffusion weighted scan, and if we look on the trace image, we see this large area of uh, restricted diffusion, right? So we're getting more signal from the infarct where there's constrained movement of the protons. And then if we look at the corresponding slice on the, of the ADC image, you can see that the same area is darker than the brain. So when you see this construct of a uh, combination of high signal intensity on the trace image, low signal intensity on the ADC map, this is what we would consider true restricted diffusion. 
If you look, for example, at the ventricle on the diffusion weighted scan, this is really quite dark because of the free movement of water in the ventricle in between the two gradients where we're covering very little signal. So this area is of low signal intensity on the trace image, but of high signal intensity on the ADC map. And so this area would be called facilitated diffusion. This is restricted diffusion. So that's the terminology that you should uh, be using and thinking about as you look at these images. But I will caution you, that's why I put this in bold, just because something is of high signal intensity on the trace image, this is not the same as having true restricted diffusion. And that's because the diffusion image is a composite of both T2 and diffusion contrast. So why not just look at the ADC map? I mean, if the ADC map is so good in terms of having pure diffusion information, uh, why, why do we even look at the trace image? And the answer is the ADC map is difficult to interpret. And I'll, I'll show you in this case. So here's the ADC map. So we don't, we're not looking at the trace image. We just look at the ADC map. And I would challenge you to find the abnormality on this image, right? So, and uh, you know, there's some low signal intensity here, low signal intensity here and so on. But when we look at the trace image, we see that there's a little, this is an infarct, a lacunar infarct along the uh, uh, internal capsule. And so this is the corresponding you know, uh, uh, area of low signal on the ADC map. So when you look at them together, it makes good sense. But if you just have the ADC image, it's, it's really just too difficult to make a confident assessment. I also want you to recognize this high signal intensity on the trace image over here, high signal intensity over here, 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 here. These are all artifacts. And so uh, we'll get to that, but be aware that there, just because something is high signal intensity on the trace image, uh, particularly when you're at the periphery of the brain, you may be looking at an artifact. Here's another example. Again, uh, this is the ADC image. And again, you, want, you wonder about these areas. Maybe these are also artifacts. I mean, it looks like the edge of the brain is a little disturbed. But again, these are some infarcts here. This is wedge-shaped white matter, gray matter that corresponds with this area here. So again, the trace image together with the ADC map is the best way, I think, to interpret the diffusion uh, information. You'll also notice some other areas of high signal intensity. Again, these are likely artifacts that you're seeing here. Now the artifacts, the two common artifacts that you see on diffusion weighted imaging are susceptibility artifacts. Uh, these are exaggerated on echoplanar imaging. And you know, at the other extreme, the scan that we perform that has the least artifact from susceptibility is the uh, FASPEN ECHO T2 weighted scan. The other artifact is called the N2 or uh, Nyquist artifact. And this is uh, due to eddy current errors that occur during the scan. But this is the artifact that gives you, it looks like three heads stacked one on top of the other. Uh, and, and so it depends on, on your scanner. You may never see this. You may see it all the time. If you do see it all the time, it's something that can be corrected with some manipulation of the uh, hardware of your scanner. But these are the most common artifacts you see. Uh, these areas of high signal intensity here. This is occurring at the junction of the inferior frontal lobes with the sphenoid sinuses. So we have an air bone brain interface, which distorts the magnetic field locally. You also see it here along the petrous ridges. These are susceptibility artifacts as well. Uh, sometimes along the edge, you'll have these little areas of high signal intensity. These can be difficult to interpret at times but the greatest likelihood is that these are uh, susceptibility artifacts as well. And depending on your scanner, how it's done, you often will see some high signal intensity along the sylvian fissure in the insula and maybe along the medial frontal lobes. But again, be, be careful to look carefully at your scans and be critical about anything that you think is abnormal in the periphery of the brain. Now, sometimes the artifacts can be very large. Now, this is a young patient with braces, and you can see on this diffusion weighted scan, we actually lose signal in the entire anterior portion of the brain. So this is a susceptibility artifact, and we know most susceptibility artifacts will give this appearance of a low signal intensity and then sort of a displaced signal along the periphery. And this is the ADC map of the same patient. So we're basically losing the whole brain 
Now this case, uh, this turned out to be of some importance because uh, there was a suspected abnormality that was uh, uh, so uh, important to determine that we actually, we had the braces taken off. And this is the repeat examination. And here you can see again, some susceptibility artifacts. And you'll see this again, this is susceptibility artifact up here, but of course, much less uh, artifact than you see on the uh, uh, image with the braces. So again, the metal in the braces gives rise to the, um, this artifact. So again, uh, these are susceptibility artifacts. And again, due to distortion of the magnetic field uh, in areas of differing tissues and exaggerated in areas of metal. And again, this is another metal artifact on uh, uh, diffusion imaging. This is a trace image. And so these areas of high signal intensity at the periphery of the artifact should not be mistaken for true restricted diffusion. So when we see areas that are bright or high signal on diffusion weighted imaging, uh, you have to consider the fact that not everything uh, that you see that's high signal on diffusion is an infarct. So uh, some of the things that will be bright on the uh, diffusion weighted trace image will be things like lymphoma uh, commonly will have restricted diffusion. And again, if you think about the histology of lymphoma, of a B cell lymphoma, you have this dense packing of these blue cells. And so the highly cellular nature of these tumors, and uh, you can also see in some uh, glial tumors, is there's, there's so much uh, organized tissue there that it limits the freedom of water. So you'll see this also in meningiomas uh, and lymphoma. Uh, so these are commonly bright on diffusion trace imaging. Epidermoids uh, also will be quite bright on diffusion weighted imaging, but this may not be due so much to the um, diffusion properties of them, but their T2 properties combined with diffusion. So this is a patient with an epidermoid. Here you see it's of high signal intensity on this T2 weighted scan with some mass effect you can see on the mammillary bodies and the midbrain. This is what it looks like on the diffusion trace image. You can see this high signal intensity here. Uh, and again, these are just artifacts at the edge of the brain uh, on this particular scanner. These are all susceptibility artifacts. Now let's look at the ADC map in this patient. Now, if we look carefully, this slice corresponds to this slice roughly here, basically looking at the top of the cerebellum. You notice that the, the epidermoid does not appear dark as we saw with the infarct in that earlier patient. So in fact, it looks actually a little brighter than the brain in places, like for example, in here, if you look at the regular brain. So the high signal intensity in this case uh, from the epidermoid is not due to pure restricted diffusion. And this is an example of why I would encourage you in all your cases where you see high signal intensity on diffusion to take the time to carefully examine the ADC map in the corresponding location. Now there is a scan that I think GE scanners will allow, it's called an exponential ADC, which is kind of a composite of the diffusion scan with the trace image. And so on those images, uh, the, the abnormality of area with restricted diffusion, instead of looking dark, will be bright. And, and if you're using that scan, you would be aware of that uh, particular pulse sequence, but it's not available on all scanners. And I don't think Siemens have that. Just to uh, continue with that theme of epidermoid, this is the typical appearance of an epidermoid in sense. There's no enhancement of it. And, and again, it's kind of a watery tumor with this long T2 relaxation time that makes it look bright here and the long T1 relaxation time that makes it look dark here compared to the fat. If you wanna learn more about uh, artifacts, I would direct you to another free online resource uh, it's a, a brief uh, uh, interactive uh, presentation. It's, I think it's called Top 10 MR Artifacts. It's also an iBook that you can get through Apple uh, if you just put my name in and uh, Top 10 MR Artifacts. And I go elaborate a little bit on the, uh, these susceptibility artifacts. This is an example of a lymphoma. This is a B cell lymphoma. Here you see this expansion of the corpus callosum. It's high signal intensity on the trace image. It's low signal intensity on the uh, ADC map. So again, we would say this is uh, likely restricted diffusion. But then look at this tumor. This is a glial tumor. Uh, 
So again, can you tell from the trace image if this is restricted diffusion or not? If we look then at the AEDC map, we see that it's not darker than the normal brain. So again, this high signal intensity is due to some combination of restricted diffusion and T2, uh, long T2 relaxation time. So, so you wouldn't mistake this for an infarct based on its location with no involvement of the cortex. And the fact that certainly for an acute infarct, it's not dark enough, nor would you mistake it for an abscess, right? So an abscess should also be, have restricted diffusion and appear quite dark on the ADC map. This tumor, of course, is extraaxial, and you can see the broad dural attachment, a little bit of this dural tail going off. This is the flare scan, so we would assume it has a longer T2 relaxation time than the brain. Here's the enhanced study, right? So this is homogeneously enhancing. This is the enhancing dural tail. Here's the, aid, the trace image, and we see that it's of high signal intensity on the trace image. This is, we'll come to this. This is another artifact. Sometimes the choroid plexus appears bright on the uh, trace image. And then this is what it looks like on the ADC map. Again, it looks dark on the ADC map. So this meningioma has restricted diffusion. And for those of you that follow that literature, there is some uh, uh, discussion uh, in the um, uh, literature about restricted diffusion in meningiomas. Does this uh, have meaning in terms of the histology of the tumor? Some of the early papers suggested that that favors that this has atypical uh, histologic features, uh, but in my experience, uh, that that's actually not true. And so I don't think you can predict anything about the nature of the meningioma from its diffusion properties. Now, this is a, a, a common uh, finding. This is not a um, artifact. This is a pitfall of imaging, is the choroid plexus often will appear very bright on the trace image. And sometimes it'll be asymmetric, uh, which makes it more difficult. But if one side's calcified and one's not, then you can see this on one side. But again, this is, these are just these degenerative cysts. Uh, these are neuroepithelial cysts that you see in the choroid plexus. And you see these are non-enhancing and a little different than the CSF in the ventricle. So don't, don't be mistaken, don't get too caught up in this. And as I suggested in, uh, in, my, in the first week that, uh, Choroid plexus infarcts do occur with posterior circulation ischemia. So if you see unilateral high signal intensity in the choroid plexus, you may be challenged in terms of distinguishing whether uh, that's uh, due to an infarct or just this normal degeneration that occurs with aging. But of course, one uh, important way to make the distinction is, of course, based on the patient's symptoms and other evidence of uh, posterior circulation ischemia. So I'm sure you're aware that the appearance of uh, infarcts changes over time. And I think there's some debate. I'm not sure what you use there in terms of uh, the timing. But if we think about a patient that you know, has a hospital, has a stroke while they're in the hospital, and so we get to the, the scan, MR scan immediately, you'll see high signal intensity on the diffusion-weighted image or trace image. It'll be dark on the ADC, and you may not see anything on the CT scan, the T2-weighted scan, or the flare scan. So the only abnormality will be on the diffusion-weighted image. More typically, we see the patient after maybe a couple hours have gone by, and on those, uh, those we'll call acute infarcts, this is gonna be, look the same way on the diffusion scan as the ADC is in the hyperacute case. The flare scan probably will be abnormal, maybe like the way I showed in that other case, but, may, but the T2 scan usually looks normal. As time goes on, eventually the infarct will appear bright on the diffusion, but look like normal brain on the ADC map. This is called pseudo-normalization. This occurs at about one week. And then by the time you get out to 10 days or 14 days, depending on the patient and circumstances, then, then the infarct may stay bright on the diffusion scan, but will also appear bright on the ADC map. And so this is, uh, this is one of the features that we know about trace imaging is now you're looking at mostly the T2-weighted uh, properties, uh, and this is what's called shine through on diffusion. So again, be aware that the combination of the diffusion scan and the ADC map can help you time the infarct, and this 
will prove to be important in a lot of your cases. For example, if the patient has multiple infarcts and they look the same on the ADC map, uh, all look the same on the diffusion and the ADC map, that would make you predict that these occurred all at the same time, maybe from a single embolus that broke up. Whereas if the patient has multiple infarcts, but they look different on the uh, ADC map, for example, one looks dark and one looks the same as brain and one looks bright, that tells you that the infarcts occurred at different times. And so these, these are important features in trying to predict the cause of the infarct. Other things that will be bright on the diffusion scan will be epidural abscess so, or, or intraparenchymal abscess. This is thought to be due to the restricted diffusion in the pus. Uh, so here you see this is a pretty typical appearance of an epidural abscess. It's gonna be bright on the T, on the diffusion weighted scan and will be dark on the ADC map, right? So this is true restricted diffusion thought to be due to all the proteins and uh, uh, cellular debris uh, within an abscess. One pitfall to be aware of, though, is that this is a post-operative case, and here you see that there's uh, T1 shortening uh, in the extraaxial space deep to the patient's craniotomy, and this is very common after uh, surgery to have a small subdural or extraaxial collection, strictly speaking, at the site of the craniotomy. But if we look two weeks later, uh, so this patient now has, let's say, an uh, in-hospital seizure or headaches or drainage from the wound, uh, sometimes they'll get an MR scan asking the question, could the patient have an infection, an intracranial infection as a result of the surgery? This is a potential pitfall. It looks like there's restricted diffusion here uh, and uh, and. And that would go along with an epidural or extraaxial uh, pus collection. But because we know there's blood in this location, blood will also give you uh, restricted diffusion or high signal intensity on the trace image. And in my experience, it's almost impossible to tell from the MR scan whether you're dealing with blood products at the operative site or infection. So be aware of that pitfall and don't overcall infection in uh, these cases. I actually saw uh, someone asked me to look at a case of this just this week uh, where it was called an epidural abscess in a post-op patient, uh, but actually uh, at, at surgery proved to be just a chronic subdural. This is a common pitfall you've probably seen uh, on MR imaging is that here we know that the fat is bright on this T1 weighted scan. And then there's this area of high signal intensity all in this midline slice here, again, just to go through that sagittal anatomy, what I, which I want you to learn. This is the rostrum of the corpus callosum, genu, body, splenium of the corpus callosum. This is gonna be the internal cerebral vein. This is the mass intermedia. This is the anterior commissure, optic chiasm. This is the infundibular recess, infundibulum, mammillary body, interpenuncular cistern. Again, so this is normal anatomy. So we ask ourselves, what could this represent? Is this blood or fat? If we look at the CT scan, we see that there is this density in the midline. And this is a normal finding with aging usually. This is called ossification of the falx. Now, uh, some people will call it calcification of the falx, but, but strictly speaking, it is ossification, meaning that there is a marrow space, which you don't see just with calcification, just like there's a marrow space in the diploic space of the skull. And so this area of marrow will have often fat, which will look bright on the T1 weighted scan. So again, it's a mistake to get too excited about this, except when you have a trauma patient. So here's a patient, trauma patient. This looks just like the ossified uh, faults with marrow we saw in the previous case. High signal intensity on the midline slice. Here it is sort of adjacent to the uh, faults. So again, is this uh, fat or is this blood? If I look at the diffusion weighted scan, I should be able to distinguish those two, right? Because the, I know this is chemical fat suppressed. Notice there's no subcutaneous fat. So the fact that this persists as it did on the T1 weighted scan tells me that this is actually blood. 
right? So use the diffusion scan in cases where you're not sure if you're looking at blood or, um, or in this case, uh, blood products. Now, this is a topic that you should be aware of is that not all acute infarcts will show restricted diffusion. This is an unusual circumstance. I will tell you that uh, I don't see it very often, uh, but I want you to be aware that it's a possibility so that you don't discount the possibility of an infarct uh, when you see the diffusion scan is not uh, typical for an acute infarct. In one review of these cases, nearly all of them occurred in the posterior fossa. But there's really, as far as I know, no explanation why this may be. It may have to do with the, um, the uh, properties of the posterior fossa. That is, there's a, quite a bit of bones surrounding the, uh, the cerebellum and so on. Now, I'm going to show you one case where MR spectroscopy was helpful. But this, I'll show you this case. This was a patient I saw some years ago and was being presented in conference in the morning. And you notice that the patient has a mass here in the cerebellum. This was a 40-some-year-old uh, patient that was returning uh, home from a night shift and was, uh, was found as, uh, ataxic uh, in a convenience store and was taken right to the hospital. Uh, and here you see that the, there's a mass effect here. There's low signal intensity or low attenuation on the CT scan. And you'll also notice for a patient of this age, the ventricles are dilated, meaning that there is sufficient mass effect here that we're obstructing the outflow of CSF. So this is an obstructive hydrocephalus. So the patient had an MR scan. This is the MR scan, and you can see that there's some enhancement in this space. And this is what it looks like on the T2-weighted scan. So this was being presented in conference. Uh, with the thought that this was a neoplasm. But this was at a time we were doing a lot of spectroscopy, and this was the diffusion scan in that patient, right? So here we, just to go back, so we have uh, it's kind of worrisome look here, worrisome look there, worrisome look there, right? If we look at the spectroscopy in this patient, though, we don't see any choline elevation, and we see this large lactate peak, which is fairly typical for an infarct. So, so the assessment, you know, the neuroradiology assessment was this is not a tumor, this is probably a subacute infarct. And we took the patient to angio, and here you can see that there is an abnormal, this was a di vertebral dissection uh, with a, a posterior fossa pica territory infarct uh, and subacute in the sense that we have this marked swelling, which led to the obstructive hydrocephalus. So even though we know that this infarct is not acute, uh, from the patient's history, we knew that this, uh, he did have a fall at work, uh, struck his head, and likely was the source of his initial dissection. And so, uh, again, be aware of the fact that the diffusion scan can be misleading in some cases of infarction, but particularly so when you're dealing with the posterior fossa. So that's uh, the end of that uh, session, uh, talking about the source, one of the sources of contrast. Uh, do you have any questions? Anything uh, can help you to understand the principles of diffusion or you're comfortable with that? All good? All right, we'll, get, we'll start on to the next topic. Uh, and then after this next topic, we'll take a break uh, before we start the third session. Alex, question from me. This is Vika. Yes, Vika. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, How are you today? You did put it in the slide, uh, but just for my clarification. So the DWI changes in acute stroke start how early? Yes. And uh, the flare changes start, Howard, in terms of timing a stroke. Is it within minutes, half an hour, an hour, two hours for the DWI? And how about the flare? You know, the thing is, like, it's hard to have these hard rules, but I would just say that what my expectation would be the flare changes will occur in a matter of hours. So if you're, let's say, four to six hours out from the infarct, you may see some early flare changes. Uh, but you won't see changes on the T2-weighted scan in that early phase. Uh, but if you're, if the patient, again, within an hour or two, you may not see anything on the flare scan, only the diffusion trace image. 
and the DWI changes? I think they would, they happen within, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to put an exact number on it, in my opinion, but probably within, uh, within an hour, you'll see changes on the diffusion scan. Got it. Thank you. All right, so let's, I'm going to talk about CTA because this is an important tool that's used uh, in uh, stroke patients. And uh, I, I guess I would ask uh, uh, you, this audience, do you use CTA in all patients that present with, to the emergency room with stroke-like symptoms, or is that only, is that ordered after an assessment of the patient and the CT, routine CT scan? Anyone want to comment about practice in Armenia? If I'm not mistaken, you know, Alex, they use when the stroke team says, for example, if I'm not mistaken, because in my clinic, we don't do, but in Erebuni Medical Center, I, I think the Susan I can, can comment, they do when uh, the team, stroke team, for example, says that you must do CT scan or not do. I see. Yeah. So, and I think, you know, it's not, it's not routine at every hospital. Uh, there are some disadvantages in making it a routine um, uh, follow-up to the CT scan, because what we eventually see is that they're doing it in patients who really don't even have stroke, or if they had like a TIA, they still get the CTA. So I think there's a overuse of CTA, but in many patients, of course, it's critical in the management of the patient. And one advantage of getting it early is the patients can get triaged directly to intervention when there is a large vessel occlusion. So, but I think if we're gonna do a CTA, it needs to be of high quality and it needs to be rapidly performed. So I just wanna talk a little bit about how to obtain a good quality uh, CTA. The ideal, for CTA imaging is to scan during maximal intra-arterial enhancement. So if you look at this as a surface reconstruction from a CTA, and you know, here you see the skull base, here we see the vertebral artery, the pica origin, basilar, here we see this uh, basilar tip aneurysm. This is gonna be A2 segments, region of the anterior communicating A1, proximal middle cerebral artery, right? So this is a normal anatomy we expect to see. And you notice there's not really any venous confusion here, that this, we're just seeing a pure arterial representation. As compared to this scan, this is the same patient done at a different time. This was a later scan, right? So a little time went by before the CTA was acquired. And now you see that there is a uh, now you see that we have enhancement in the internal cerebral veins here. We have <coughs> enhancement here in basal vein of Rosenthal, which as you can see, parallels the course of the posterior cerebral artery. So we have all this confusion. I'm sorry, these are actually the septal veins. This is gonna be the internal cerebral veins here. And these will converge to a form vein of Galen. So anyway, the, we have both uh, arterial and venous anatomy, and this creates a lot of confusion uh, when we have these veins that overlap the arteries. So you, we want this, we don't want this. So how do we get pure arterial uh, enhancement? So one obstacle in obtaining a rapid CTA is waiting to see the creatinine. Uh, I know early on there was some, this became an issue in some of our patients where the, you know, the protocol was that before an injection of contrast, they would check the creatinine. But uh, this, this is a unnecessary delay uh, in the acquisition of the CTA and the general consensus, at least uh, here in the US, is to just press on. Uh, this was a paper, and I think uh, aptly was called Neurons Over Nephrons. And in this one, uh, non-randomized evidence, evidence uh, shows that by doing CTA and CTP, CT, the CT perfusion, did not result in a statistically increase in acute uh, renal uh, disease. So, so the sense is that when the patient presents with symptoms of say a large vessel occlusion and you wanna get a CTA, you don't need to wait for the uh, blood work to come back. So how do we get optimal contrast injection timing? And in the sense, why isn't everyone the same? Well, one reason people differ, it has to do with heart rate and ejection fraction. So young patients, young athletes with very low heart rates can have a delay in the arrival of the contrast. 
and older patients in particular with the changes of lower ejection fraction can also have delays in the arrival of contrast. So the goal is to be able to achieve an attenuation of 250 Hounsfield units or more in the artery. This is a number I sort of used, I made up, I mean, sort of in my experience that once you drop below 250, the, the, you don't, you're not able to create these very nice surface models of the anatomy. Again, just through, again, M1, A1, A2 branches coming up. So what are the different techniques we can use? One is a timing bolus. And what, what is done in this technique is a small injection of contrast. So if your routine contrast injection for CTA is say 70, uh, CCs, you can inject say 10 to 15, maybe even six to seven, depending on your scanner, small bolus of contrast followed by saline to wash it out of the arm and then watch uh, to see the arrival of the contrast in the carotid arteries. So this requires a little bit of uh, planning ahead of time, uh, but I think is a very robust technique and allows you to pretty precise figure out when the contrast is gonna arrive uh, in the intracranial circulation. Another technique is this tracker technique where a uh, tracker, uh, is basically it's a cursor that you place arbitrarily, it could be in the carotid, it could be in the ascending aorta. Uh, it, it measures a change in the attenuation uh, or in that case of MRA in the signal. And so the scanner automatically triggers the injection based on that tracker. The problems with trackers is that, especially in the carotid, is that the patient moves a little bit, it moves from the carotid to the jugular vein, which will give you an arbitrarily a late injection. And then the third technique is just use a fixed time of about 20 seconds, which works for most people, honestly. And so if when all else fails, uh, you can just use a fixed time uh, if you're having trouble with the other techniques. And then another thing I just want to talk about is, do you inject the left or right arm? And does it matter? So this is an example of the uh, curve of the contrast arrival in the carotid artery. And here you can see this is in this video, this is what it looks like. You scan, put the, park the scanner at a single slice in the neck. You use a low KV, a low MA technique because you don't need uh, a lot of uh, resolution. You're just looking for the arrival of contrast. And so by putting a cursor over the carotid artery, you'll get a peak arrival of contrast. Now you'll notice that there is about 10 seconds that elapse here. Uh, and so th this, is, this is not an unusually uh, short um, uh, contrast arrival. If you put a, a little dead time in here, you know that nothing's gonna appear for the first six to eight seconds. So you don't need to start scanning uh, from the, uh, uh, beginning of the contrast infusion. But you have to remember to add it in. So if we say that the peak here is at about, let's say this is 12 seconds, we have to remember to add in the delay time that we put in. But this is, the, this is how uh, uh, bolus uh, timing is done. Now, here's a scan. Uh, you may see this on occasion. There's dense enhancement of the patient's left jugular bulb and a little bit of sigmoid sinus when you compare it to the right side. And so you might think, well, how could all of this contrast be in the jugular vein on one side and not the other? Maybe there's a dural fistula, but patient, let's just say this patient has no symptoms of a dural fistula. What do we do then? Or in this case, you notice here's the uh, uh, internal jugular vein is densely enhanced. So if you look at this, you know, we actually have artifacts arriving from the contrast in the internal jugular vein, which differs, differs greatly from the, uh, from the other side and the carotid artery. So how do we explain this difference? And the answer is these, both these patients had left-sided arm injections. In fact, you see a little bit of contrast here on the left side. And this, this came home to us. This was a case I saw some years ago. 43-year-old uh, came in with dizziness after a fall. And this is what his CTA looked like. Well, this, this created a lot of discussion in the department trying to figure out what, what we were looking at here. But if you notice that you're seeing this contrast staining in the cortex here, and you see these internal cerebral veins, but, but it looks very different than the rest of the brain. And this patient actually went on and had a conventional angiogram, which was normal. But before we discharged the patient, when we actually repeated the CTA uh, 
with a right arm injection, which was completely normal. And, and we ended up publishing this case because what was happening in this patient when we looked for it, we noticed that the innominate vein here was being narrowed as it came under the sternum. And so normally the innominate vein crosses, of course, from the left side to the right. So there can be valves in, in, in this junction or there can be actual compression in older patients. And so what this causes is a restriction of flow. So if you're injected rapidly in the left arm and you have any obstruction to flow along the way, whether it's from a valve or compression, the contrast will jet up the left jugular vein, which basically dilutes the contrast and delays arrival of contrast. So just be aware of this pitfall in imaging. So again, the reason why it matters is the anatomy does not look like this. Let's say this is the right subclavian and this is the left subclavian. The internal jugular veins don't merge together to join the superior vena cava like this, which I'm sure you know. But, the, but keep in mind that from the right side, it's a straighter shot into the superior vena cava. When you come from the left side, because of a valve that can occur in here or any kind of compression of the innominate vein, the contrast will reflux up the left jugular vein. So, so it's pretty easy to implement this into your practice. It's not a 50-50 arrangement. If you have a choice of where to place the line for CTA, and the same rule applies to MRA, always use the right side. And we've looked at this a little bit systematically and found that it's worth somewhere between 10 and, and 50 Hounsfield units of improved enhancement of the CTA by using the right side and the left side. So again, these are all techniques you can use to optimize your CTA. Now, while we're on this topic of optimizing, I just want to talk to you about the CT scan itself. And my recommendation is to, you want to view the scan in multiple planes. You want to look at multiple windows and levels, and you want to look at thin as well as thick section in the specific setting of a patient with a stroke. Now, why do we, why do I say that? So let's look at this case. So here we see this patient has these kind of paired areas of low signal intensity at the periphery of the cerebellum. And this is an older patient. And this is a common pitfall that you'll see in these patients where the horizontal fissure is wide enough that it will give you this appearance of bilateral infarcts. But in this case, when you look at the sagittal reconstruction through the right side, this actually was an infarct. This is not the horizontal fissure masquerading as an infarct. This actually was an infarct. So it's much easier to appreciate when you see it in the orthogonal plane of reconstruction. Uh, here's another patient. This, let's take a look at this scan. So as we go up, I would ask you, do you see anything abnormal? And this patient had vision changes. So just look carefully at this slice here. And just continue. Okay. And this patient had vision changes. Now I'm going to go, this is actually a slice from that scan. This is what the patient looked like one day later. So the abnormality here is this low attenuation of the medial occipital lobe here in the region of the visual cortex. And if you can contrast it with the other side, this would be much easier to recognize on a coronal reconstruction than on this axial reconstruction. So multiplanar reconstruction is very helpful. The other thing is you want it in a case like this, you'd see this is a normal CT uh, window and level. And you'll notice that this is a leniform nucleus. The right side is blurred. This is gonna be much easier to see on a uh, narrow window uh, uh, and level setting. And the expression they use is 40-40. I don't always use exactly that, but it sort of captures what you wanna do is you wanna have the level set about the attenuation or the, uh, yeah, the attenuation of the normal brain and use a narrow, uh, uh, so the level is gonna be 40 and the window is gonna be 40, which is quite narrow. And that's gonna optimize your chances of seeing parenchymal changes in the brain. This is what the patient looked like a little later. And this is a completed infarct in the basal ganglia. This, uh, this doesn't just apply when you're talking about infarcts. This is broadly true. Here's a patient, normal brain, sort of is like an 80-50 uh, window level. And this looks like skull here, right? And then this is what it looks like at a wider window, about the same level. And this patient, of course, has a tumor here that's sort of lost here because 
by using a narrower window, it gets blended into the bone. So this is true for subdural hematomas as well. So you want to get make a habit of looking at multiple windows and levels to, to try to examine the entire brain. And this is based on the principle that the, the scanner has uh, whatever, let's say it can go from minus 2000 Hounsfield units to plus 2000 Hounsfield units, uh, but are, we're not able to display that on the scan uh, as uh, uh, in a grayscale fashion, and that we, we are limited in terms of the uh, shades of gray that we can discern. So we can only look at bits and pieces of that broad range of Hounsfield units. This patient has a history of acute left-sided hemiparesis. So, this really looks like a normal scan. But this is the uh, cerebral, um, this actually should be C cerebral blood flow. You can see that the right side is uh, abnormal. So we'll go back, let's look again at that scan. Now, how sure are you about the middle cerebral artery? Is this a dense MCA sign? I think that would be, to me, a hard decision to make. But I know that there's an abnormality here. I know the patient's symptomatic. I think this matches pretty well that there's an abnormality on the right side. So if we go back and we, and this was done on a multi-detector scanner uh, where the detector collimation was an order of one millimeter or less, you can reconstruct the data, not in five millimeter slices, but in one millimeter slices. And so here it's easier to see this dense MCA on the thin section because there's less volume averaging with the CSF in the sylvian fissure. So again, thin sections, I think, are very helpful in making uh, it more apparent when the patient has a dense MCA. And then this is the CTA in that patient. Here you see the, in the CTA, this transition in density. And on the maximum intensity, there's, a, there's an embolus uh, here in the proximal M1 segment. So again, thin sections, multiplanar reconstruction will be very helpful to you in your um, uh, uh, understanding of the abnormalities of CT. And I think those, if you're not implementing those changes in your CTA or those techniques uh, by, by incorporating them into your practice, you're gonna get better quality scans that will be easier to read. So I wanna take a, we'll take a five minute break here uh, in the last session, last half hour. I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, cerebral angiography. So cerebral angiography is an important uh, tool uh, in the both diagnostic world and, of course, is integral in uh, neurointervention. And we'll I'll go through some of the principles of that in this uh, session. So the techniques for imaging cerebral blood vessels that in common use are MRA, and, of course, with that MRV, uh, CTA, and CTV. Uh, this is best performed on, with a multi-detector CT scanner because, as I mentioned, the uh, ideal is to try to capture the intra-arterial arrival of the contrast. So the shorter the acquisition time of the CTA, the better chance you can capture that window of time because the time between the arrival of contrast in the arteries to the opacification of the veins is probably on the order of five seconds. So again, if your scan takes 15 seconds, you're gonna have uh, venous filling. And then finally, this last technique, which we'll call conventional angiography or commonly called now digital subtraction angio. Although, of course, it wasn't always digital subtraction. Uh, so let's take this uh, example. Uh, here's a young patient, no uh, medical history, presents with a new bleed. And here you can see there's a parenchymal bleed with some edema around it. Uh, patient had a CTA, which was negative. Uh, the problem here, though, is you see that the timing was off and we're probably too early in the acquisition and the attenuation in the arch here was about 217 Hounsfield units. So we have this kind of like 
kind of peaked looking CTA where we don't have a lot of contrast in these MCA branches here. The MRA was performed, which was negative. Now, the thing about MRA in most hospitals, the entire brain is not covered. In order to uh, make the time reasonable for the MRA, usually the upper portion of the brain is not included. And so we tend to get this focus study around the circle of Willis, probably and ideally going down to the upper neck, as you see here. But on the, on the DSA study, you can see there's this little puddle of contrast right here. And then a month later, the patient came back. And here you see this little puddle of contrast here along uh, this uh, middle cerebral branch here. And so this proved to be a mycotic aneurysm, which was inapparent on the CTA, was inapparent on the MRA. So this was an example of where the digital subtraction angiogram was critical in the diagnosis of this patient. And I think whenever I get requests like that, it says, you know, CTA indication rule at mycotic aneurysm. I remember this case. And I think it's fair to say that uh, there are some problems uh, that require either high resolution or, or high temporal resolution, like the diagnosis of AVM, uh, which uh, require the benefit of uh, uh, DSA. In this case, a transthoracic ultrasound revealed vegetations and again, patient had mycotic aneurysm. The first catheter angiogram was performed in 1927 by a neurologist, Igas Moniz, uh, and was used for CNS diagnosis for nearly 50 years prior to the invention of CT. So uh, in my residency in 1979, there were still a neuroradiologist, Dr. Ring, who could look at a cerebral angiogram and predict all sorts of displacements of veins and arteries, kind of an art that has been lost now as we become uh, accustomed to looking for mass effect on uh, CT and MR imaging. But it was a cerebral angiography along with uh, uh, pneumoencephalography were the uh, main uh, diagnostic tools uh, prior to the invention of CT. Interestingly to me, at least uh, Moniz was, he was a controversial uh, a figure uh, because of his other contribution was the uh, widespread use of frontal uh, leucotomies. And, uh, and so this sort of fell into disarray and uh, again has colored, I think the whole world of uh, neuro intervention uh, with these stimulators that are routinely used for uh, Parkinson's disease, but uh, have potential uses in things like management of a a compulsive, obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, and so on. Uh, so I think the, I think the, uh, the progression of that field has been diminished by that legacy of the frontal leucotomy. But now we use digital subtraction angiogram. Uh, this it was originally a venous technique. Uh, in fact, when I was first, again, uh, first during my residency, it started out as a technique to see the intracranial vasculature without having to put a catheter in by using rapid injection of contrast in the veins. And it basically uh, in, in, increased the contrast between the normal tissues and the uh, vessels that allowed you to see some of the vessels, but the image quality was poor. Uh, rapid injection of intravenous contrast has its own sets of problems. And eventually people started uh, uh, doing digital subtraction imaging with arterial injections. So there's a paper from 1982. It's one of the early papers uh, uh, talking about the benefits of uh, um, using uh, digital subtraction. And so now we use these modern, these are biplane digital subtraction angiogram suites where we have these flat plate uh, receivers, x-ray tubes, and these can be moved uh, to be perpendicular or angled in any sort of fashion, allowing multi, multiple views to obtain of the brain. The access to the arterial system is obtained using a cell near technique, either from the femoral or radial artery, which is some people have uh, incorporated into a lot of their uh, cases because it's well tolerated by patients. Uh, cardiology has been uh, using uh, arm uh, access for a long time. Uh, here's just an example of the usual access needle. Uh, usually then this, the wires placed into the uh, often the femoral artery, 
and then uh, followed by either a sheath or the catheter. And these catheters have different shapes uh, and the guide wires come in different shapes. I'm sorry, these are the guide wires. This is gonna be a you know, straight wire. We have a, a J wire. This is a floppy wire. And then the catheters have different shapes and these shapes are chosen based on the expected anatomy. For example, for spinal angiography, you would choose uh, one like a catheter like this perhaps. And for patients who have atherosclerotic disease and are aged, where you know you're gonna have difficulty in getting into the proximal arch vessels that use these curved catheters. And this is an example of how you use what's called a Simmons catheter, uh, where you actually engage the vessels by pulling back on the catheter rather than advancing it into the vessel. But you can see the problem in this sort of configuration of the aortic arch is that as you try to push the catheter in, you actually push it out of the vessel. So these require a little bit of skill and experience to reform these catheters, but a very effective technique. For most diagnostic procedures, it requires maybe as little as 20 minutes, could be longer depending on patients with different um, difficult anatomy uh, for a complete diagnostic study. The stroke risk it's really hard to know exactly because it does depend on the patient's age and the skill of the physician, but it's probably reasonable to stay in the one to 2% uh, rate. And then of the, all the patients who have strokes, the majority of them uh, recover. So these are usually small areas involved that, are, uh, that usually the patients uh, are not uh, left with a lasting disability. Contrast allergy, of course, is extremely rare with intra-arterial injection. So we don't uh, really, I don't think that's a strong consideration. So why are we still using DSA when we have CTA, advanced CTA and MMRA and so on? So again, DSA is still superior to CTA for both spatial and temporal resolution. When we think about temporal resolution, you want to think about how many frames of imaging can you get in a, in a certain amount of time. So a cerebral angiogram, you can uh, do sub-second uh, image acquisition, but if your CTA acquisition is, let's say, seven seconds, that your temporal resolution can be no less than seven seconds, and it's going to be, of course, more with the setup and contrast injection and so on. You can also, it's also used for problem solving and, of course, used for intervention. If we look at this patient, this patient has acute aphasia, and you can see, if we go back, kind of a classic dense distal ICA. So dense IC compared to the right side. So this patient has a proximal occlusion. If we look carefully, you can see there might be a little blurring. If you look at the basal ganglia here, and here you see a little bit of blurring in the basal ganglia. That's all you're gonna get is the, and maybe the insular ribbon is interrupted here, but otherwise normal here. So these are the early changes uh, that you see with ischemia. Just another uh, enlarged image of that frame. Leniform nucleus here, here's the border with the internal capsule. You see this kind of blurry look here to the basal ganglia. That again, is all you're gonna get in some of these early cases. And this is of course, when you wanna intervene. This CTA in this patient, again, just to go through that anatomy, A2 segments here. This is the uh, reconstructed image. You can see that there's a thrombus here and this is so-called T occlusion. Uh, at the distal ICA. Here's the angiogram. This is a common injection. You can see the external branches here. See a little nasal blush. Here we get follow the internal the cervical internal carotid into the entry in the skull. Here's the cavernous carotid. And we're not seeing uh, any normal uh, ACA branches and maybe just a trickle here into an MCA branch here. So this is the A anterior posterior projection. Here's the lateral projection. Here you see the cavernous carotid ophthalmic artery. This is the posterior communicating artery and actually the fetal origin of the PCA and maybe some little trunk that's filling off of here. Maybe this is the anterior choroidal filling and we're not getting any ACA or MCA filling. So this is again, a typical appearance of a T occlusion. And we know patients with T occlusions, if this patient goes untreated, that this can result in a malignant infarct where the swelling can be sufficient to kill the patient uh, due to displacement. 
Now, again, you see some late filling of branches. These can be filling from collaterals uh, as we talked about in the last uh, session. This is post thrombolysis. And you see in this early portion of the thrombolysis that they've opened the distal carotid, they've opened the MCA, and we still have an occlusion here at the junction of the A1, A2 segment. And they went back and opened this up. I don't have all of the frames in this, but it's a nice indication, a representation of how angiography is used here. You can see this late filling of some of the ACA branches, and there's probably a thrombus sitting here. So what are the toolbox? What do we uh, terminology need to be aware of when you're doing uh, digital subtraction angiography? Prescribing the way the injection is done. And this is uh, these features are the rate, the rise, and the volume. So when you're injecting, say, a vertebral artery, you might use a rate of eight cc's per second. You might use a volume of 10 cc's total. And the rise time is how much time it takes from the time the injection starts till you reach peak flow. And by manipulating this, you can change whether you get a tight bolus or a little slower bolus. And this is often used when you have a precarious catheter position or a catheter that's up against the wall of the vessel, you can use a slower rise time to avert uh, dissection and the catheter kicking out. Uh, the, um, you have, your views, you have a choice of the views. Uh, I will talk a little bit about how to recognize in loops as compared with aneurysms. Uh, and again, in, interpretation skills are essential because there are a lot of pitfalls in imaging and judgment about knowing how hard to go after a vessel and how important that is. <clears throat> so if we take this uh, single frame from a uh, angiogram, this patient has an aneurysm. So the question is, is this the aneurysm or is this the aneurysm? Now, if we look carefully at them, you notice this one has a high attenuation so it's darker than the other vessels here, branch, you know, portions of the vessel. This looks about the same as the parent vessel. So when you see this configuration, you should suspect this is an aneurysm and you should suspect this is a loop. And this is because where there's crossing of vessels, there is an accumulation of attenuation. And this is true for, uh, uh, all angiography. And so again, if, the, uh, if we call the attenuation of the vessel a value of four, where it crosses, we have a higher attenuation because of the composite uh, density of the contrast increases its attenuation. So again, if we think about um, a DSA compared, however, to like an MRA, in an MRA, we use maximum intensity projection. And so a cross array like this, connecting uh, you know, one anatomic location with another, the only thing that registers is the peak of the uh, signal that we have on the MRA. Unlike a digital subtraction angiogram where you truly have an additive quality. So again, this is uh, what you would see in a loop on maximum intensity projection. This is what you see on a DSA. You see that there's an increased uh, attenuation in the area of the overlap. When you have maximum intensity projection, you don't have this additive quality. And so this is important in the recognition of aneurysms and differentiating from loops. If we have an aneurysm that's sticking off the side of a vessel, when we turn it so we're looking down the barrel of the aneurysm, you get this additive effect. So for example, in this case, uh, here's a uh, cerebral angiogram, and you can see these are artifacts from a little bit of motion that were unsubtracted, right? So be aware of that. And so the question you might ask, is this an aneurysm or is this a loop? So again, this is a loop, this is a loop, this is an aneurysm. And if you look carefully, there's a little bit of a double density right here. When we look at this in another view, so again, let's look focus on this area right here. And there you see this double density, right? And then this, you see the difference between the loop here and the aneurysm. So when we look down in the opposite projection, now we're looking down the barrel of the aneurysm here, here we're looking from the side. <clears throat> you can see this is a posterior communicating artery aneurysm that lies right here. Notice it has the same uh, attenuation as the parent vessel. 
So again, this is an important technique in terms of the evaluation of cerebral angiography. Again, the loops will be of high attenuation because the additive quality. Show you uh, sort of these last cases. Uh, this is a patient with uh, a history of pulsatile um, brewery and uh, and here you see these numerous blood vessels that don't really, there's too many blood vessels here you see along the tentorium. But what kind of assessment can you make about this? You could say, well, you know, maybe this is uh, uh, some kind of vascular variant, uh, but what you really wanna know is, is there a fistula or a shunt, an arteriovenous shunt here? You cannot make that determination from CTA alone. This is a single view, a single point in time. So in order to uh, make that assessment, you need to do digital subtraction and geography. So here's the DSA in that patient. So we can see this very large occipital branch here. And the important finding in this patient is the early appearance of a vein. So again, this is uh, enlarged external uh, carotid branches. And then you see, if you look carefully, the ghost of the sigmoid sinus and jugular bulb here. So the early appearance of a vein is critical in the diagnosis of, in this case, a dural fistula, but you'll also see that with arteriovenous malformations. And so this is what makes uh, DSA uh, still an essential part of the diagnostic uh, toolbox for neuroradiology. And we just carry that out. Another way you can look at it is to go backwards. So here we're in the uh, venous phase. So the question would be, when's the earliest time you see that vein? And I can see that vein into here. So here we're in a basically an uh, like a, a early arterial phase, and we already have venous filling. So this is a dural fistula. One thing I just want to make you aware of, because you may encounter a case like this, and it's important not to get too excited about this, it is very common to see these little flea bite infarcts, I call them, on diffusion-weighted imaging after DSA. Uh, and it, this is especially so if there's an intervention like placement of a pipeline uh, or there's a complicated thr uh, thrombectomy. It's very common to see little areas of diffu restricted diffusion in the brain. These are usually asymptomatic. It speaks to the fact there are a lot of parts of the brain that are in a sense silent. It also speaks to the resiliency of the brain. And I, I don't know if these are necessarily considered a complication of the procedure, uh, meaning that these are uh, due to something uh, going wrong during the procedure or mishandling by the operator. Uh, these are really, I think, part and parcel of cerebral angiography. And this is the sort of thing I mean by these little artifact or infarcts that you'll see sometimes after uh, DSA or intervention, uh, these little small infarcts. These are usually asymptomatic. But again, don't, I don't think if you see these on diffusion scan in a patient who's uh, post-intervention uh, or DSA, uh, I don't think it's uh, appropriate to uh, suggest that these are a complication of the procedure. So in summary, I'm just going to point out that there's still a role for digital subtraction in geography. And there was a time when uh, this was considered part and parcel of neuroradiology that you know, MR, CT, DSA were the diagnostic tools, at least in contemporary um, uh, diagnostic neuroradiology. But to do DSA requires good judgment and considerable skill. Uh, you want to generate uh, really high quality images and safely. And then interpretation requires a good understanding of cerebral vascular anatomy, pathology. And I've pointed out here, you also have to understand uh, how the images are created and, and what the meaning uh, of the uh, um, uh, techniques uh, formation is. And so with that, that's the end of uh, week two. And um, I hope uh, you found, I'm sure some of that is uh, things that you already knew or part of your practice, and but hopefully there's enough uh, uh, new information there to be of value to you. Any uh, any questions for me or no no no. Thank you thank very you. much, dear Alexa. 
Well, thanks for joining me and uh, we'll, we'll meet again uh, next week. In the meantime, feel free to contact me with any questions or suggestions.